sisters. Uh, welcome to our September edition of Book Club. Tonight we are discussing one of our book club's favorite authors, Lane Moriarty. We are discussing our September read, of course, Truly Madly Guilty. And this is our second time reading Moriarty together. We read Big Little Lies last year and loved it so much we decided to definitely put her back on the list. So we are going to get started today with our icebreaker, of course, and it is what is your first week of fall tradition? Or do you have, you know, a tradition that just kind of kicks off your fall every year? For me, it is definitely going to be sipping pumpkin tea out of these adorable pumpkin mugs from Pottery Barn, decorating for fall, and burning a pumpkin apple candle. That is my my kickoff, like, oh, it's on. <laughs> Tabitha, do you have any kick off fall traditions? Um, I don't know if I would call it tradition, but so far what uh, my daughters and I did was we, and I put out the fall decorations, but we did a kit. It's like a, um, a craft kit that you can buy at Michael's and it's really cute, but it comes with all the pieces and it's a cute little apple orchard scene with like pumpkins and little, um, little fall friends like a little fox and squirrel and it's really cute so we put that together all um i try to buy them off season and then store them and then bring them out to put them together and then use it as part of our decor and it's just a nice little way to you know celebrate in the house quickly you know so they season and you know this is fall and you know it also means autumn and we you know we do a whole little thing together and I think that's so cute so I guess it's kind of like the equivalent of sometimes when people do um you know the um, gingerbread houses in <laughs> Christmas time where we just put together a little fall house kit um together and it's all and it's great because everything's all there and it's little stickers and you pull it apart and you you make a cute little scene so that's what we did this year. Our traditions are um, sound a lot like what Tabitha just said with the crafting and stuff. And um, I do have these seasonal acorns that I bring out. I don't know if uh, you can. Oh yeah, they're at the top here. Uh, those come out, and uh, you know, try to live a little more seasonally. I changed like dining room decor, that kind of stuff, and the usual apple picking. And I love walking this time of year, so uh, we definitely make a conscious effort to uh, get out there and enjoy the crisp air before it gets too cold. Um, I don't really have a great answer to this. Um, I don't know if it's partly because the first week of fall generally doesn't feel like fall here. Um, and so it just, oh, but you can't tell. Um, this year, though, it has actually, we've had a couple of days where it's been cool. Um, but I don't really have any, I don't think, our house. It doesn't really start to feel like fall until around Halloween. So usually Halloween is what makes it feel like it's finally fall at my house. So I usually decorate, I have not yet. I, well, I mean, I just like pull out pumpkins and um, you know, things that I like to start them in September and then I go a little more Halloween-y with my pumpkins um for october and then go back to just plain pumpkins and and add, i add a turkey in for november um because we have thanksgiving at my house and then i have a like a small chalkboard wall that i like to decorate for the seasons um and i well i'm looking at it and i need to update it because i started um for the very beginning of fall but now i i want to do it for october but um and then I also bust out my fall wardrobe and it is 86 here today. So thank goodness my fall wardrobe included this sleeveless knee length dress or I would have passed out today. Um, so, you know, thank God for small manacles. <laughs> um, but that's my, that's my basic um, thing. Just bust out the fall wardrobe and all the pumpkins. Um. Just, you know, basic fall, like, let's get the pumpkin flavored stuff. Um, so I really, even though they release it before the first day of fall, I really try to hold out and, like, get a pumpkin spice latte, like, on the first day of fall and, like, kind of wait for that. And we were so blessed that on the first day of fall, it felt like fall this year. And so even though this week it doesn't, 
and you know um, I went to Trader Joe's and I bought like the little pumpkin iced cookies and uh, all the Trader Joe's like fun fall stuff and I probably will go to Target this week and um, pull out my fall decor. I usually don't decorate until the 1st of October because I'm like, no, I have to wait till the 1st because I don't know. I just want to wait. Um, and I do that. And I don't know. So just some basic fun stuff. Um, getting ready. We'll do, we'll do the apple orchard. We'll do the pumpkin patch. We do like all the pretty basic normal stuff uh, that people do. All right, I was talking to Jackie on the live chat about the Bath and Body Works fall haul that I have going. It's going to go live. It's locked and loaded, so it's going to go live at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning, and she was saying she wanted to watch it before she went to go get her fall candles, and she's in the East Coast. So anyway, I was like, oh, good. You can watch it and be there when they're, when they're open because they probably open at 10 for her. All right, so what was your experience reading uh, the book? It's always our kind of softball question to get us started. So I love Moyarty, as you guys know, but I really struggled with getting into this book. It was such a slow start for me. I don't think it picked up until at least the middle. Um, and then, so I tried to listen to it, but this particular narrator that is on Audible at least, she narrates all of Moyarty's books, at least The Husband's Secret and Big Little Lies for sure. And oh my gosh, I don't know if it's just me, but every time she narrates a kid's voice, it let, like her voice goes into like extremely squeaky, like, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like horrendous. I might have to play it just so you guys can know what I'm talking about if you read it. So I struggled a little bit getting into it. Um, I really do appreciate Moyarty's ability to kind of weave a mystery around like chiclet, just a ton of relational nuances that you kind of have to like pick through. So she definitely didn't disappoint there. That's, that's kind of her signature uh, writing style and, and kind of what she delivers. So definitely what I expected, but I really, for some reason, struggled to like get into this one and get into the characters. And usually I just kind of fly right through. So I don't know, maybe that was just me. You guys have to let me know. Yeah, I would say three stars. I, yeah. Sorry, Tab. That's okay. So for me, um, I listened to it and I loved it. I give it um, four and a half. I love a good story. I actually <laughs> felt as if the narrator did a great job with the kids because that's how they sound. <laughs> um, they're very annoying and high pitched and, ah, and you're just like, please stop talking. Um, <laughs> but I felt like she did like a great job. I was, I was like into the story immediately. Um, I felt as if, okay, yeah, okay, what happened at this barbecue, man? <laughs> was it, I was thinking, wow, did one of the kids get molested? What happened? You know, I was just thinking, like, what's going, what's going to happen? And I like that. It was like a slow build. Um, um, I, I like, I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed Vid and uh, Tiffany. They seem like <laughs> that would definitely be an entertaining couple to go to a barbecue <laughs> with. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I thought it was fun. Like just a, I like a good story. I like funny characters. Um, I felt like it was balanced out enough, like something that I could relate to with, you know, best friends or those friends that is this really my best friend or are we just stuck with each other kind of like family kind of thing. So I felt like the different themes that were we through, I could relate to. And yeah, I wanted to know how it ended and it seemed to tie it, tie it up nice in a bow for me at the end. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I agree completely with Tabitha. Four and a half stars for me too. Leanne Moriarty is definitely uh, one of my favorite authors as well. Um, this wasn't uh, challenging for me to read at all. Her, the most challenging book I've read of hers was, uh, I believe, The Last Anniversary. That one just droned on and on. But um, this one was easy to get through. Um, great story, um, great uh, back and forth, and great perspective from the perspectives from the different characters. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I would probably give it somewhere around four, four and a half stars. Um, I had heard a lot of, I didn't hear any specifics, but I had heard views about this and that it was really slow to like unveil what was really happening. Um, so I kind of knew that going in. Um, I think it was a little bit harder for me to get into than Big Little Lies as far as like the mystery, like figuring out what they're talking about. Um, but it didn't really bother me. Um, I don't know. I, 
I guess maybe I was prepared for that. Um, I feel like kind of all of her books are kind of like that. You don't totally understand what's happening. This one I felt did draw it out a little bit further than others, which is probably why a lot of people, um, I have heard a lot of people um, gave up on it um, uh, that started reading it like when it first came out. Um, and I think that's probably why. But for me, I don't know, like characters, they weren't my favorite characters, but I felt like they were realistic and they were, even though they were, uh, that was what made them realistic and believable. And so that's kind of what I wanted out of the story. And I feel like it delivered a good story. I'm conflicted because the beginning, I was super excited. I really liked it and was hooked. And then the end, I was really happy with the end. Um, I enjoyed some of the little twists at the end. Um, but I could, the middle had me crawling out of my skin. Um, I just did not like not knowing what happened. It was way too long of a buildup for me. And then I just kept thinking like, well, I'm going to find out. And it's halfway through the book and I don't even, what else are they going to tell me? Or, you know, what else of the story is there going to be? Which I was happy with the end. Once we finally found out what actually happened, then I was like, okay, hey, moving on and then I enjoyed the story but I could not I think I prefer a who done it than knowing everything that happened and what did they do. I don't know. I just I kept like had all these hypotheses and I thought it was like crazy stuff but then the fact that like Dakota felt bad about something, I was like, no, I can't like ah it just was I don't know. It was tearing me up and it felt slow. Like it it drug for me. Like it wasn't a good anticipation. So but I love the end, and oh, I don't know, three and a half stars, maybe. It was um, tougher for me, even though I liked large portions of it. The whole middle was like, oh, come on, just tell me. So three and a half, I would say. I gave it four, and um I think that it definitely picks up about page like 170. Like when you start, when it starts really bouncing back and forth, like then the chapters are only like three to five pages each. And it's like, and then to where you can see the timelines are starting to meet up and you're like, okay, I, I know I'm going to find out soon. And I kind of liked that because it started picking up and I, I like the way that she, not just who did the thing is right. Like, um, like in big little lies, like not just who did the thing, but what was the thing? I do like that. She plays it that way. Like, so you have two things you're trying to figure out the whole time, like who's at fault and, or not the whole time, but a chunk of the time and who, and what was the thing that was done. And I think that there's a lot of other like interesting backstory going on with like Erica's mom and why Erica is the way she is. And, and Pam, like there, it's it is very like well developed characters. So that's that's why I gave it a four. Awesome. All right, our second question: What was your favorite quote or passage in the book? So one particularly made me laugh out loud when when Moriarty was describing Erica, and I didn't get the page, and then I went back and I couldn't find it. And she said Erica was type A, and she didn't understand why you'd want to be any other way. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. Uh, I, I'm a bit of an Erica, as you guys probably know. So I thought that was too funny. But yeah, other than that, I didn't really have one that, that stuck out too much of, that, that isn't already in our uh, question lineup here. So I guess I'll pass it to Tab. Um, well, like you guys know, I listen. So sometimes uh, the quotes get by me. But um, I do like the beginning where it says, this is a story that begins with a barbecue. Like, so, that's just so silly. But I feel like, okay, who hasn't in their life experienced a barbecue, right? So I feel like that automatically allows you to kind of universally, like, feel like you're at home, like, okay, <laughs> what can go wrong at a barbecue, you know, besides people like getting drunk or there being a fight or what, you know, what, what is it? What went wrong that like had such an effect on all of the, um, the three families? Um, so I don't know. I just like that concept. I like that it's so simple. And then 
you know, she just kind of weaves this whole story around something so simple that we all can kind of relate to. Um, my favorite quote actually um, was actually uh, in question seven, uh, where uh, Clementine wonders what sort of a person Erica could have been. Um, so I'll I'll hold off on on that one. We can talk about that one later. Um, but yeah, that was that was poignant for me. Um, but uh, maybe I'll just say uh, my favorite character, and it was Vid. Uh, I thought he was hilarious. I thought he was gregarious. I, he just he he kills me. And um, what I really like about him and his storyline. Uh, anyway, uh, was a part where, and I don't want to spoil it, but um, when his wife thought that she was keeping something from him and then he acknowledges that he knew all along. So um, I really liked him. I liked his personality. I think he'd he'd be a hoot and I wish my neighbor was like that. Okay, mine is, um, it's kind of a long passage. Um, practicing the cello before her audition and she's talking about the wolf tone um as clementine dropped her bow and tried to imagine her life without erica in it without the other always by the guilt two notes aggravation guilt aggravation guilt she picked up her bow and deliberately played the wolf note over and over letting the sound aggravate her and warm its way down her ear canal, vibrating against her eardrum, creeping into her brain, throbbing at the center of her forehead. She stopped. Um, you, you shouldn't put up with the wolf tone, Ainsley had told her. Get it looked at. When she tried the wolf tone eliminator, it was initially a relief. It had taken her a little while to realize that something else was gone along with her wolf. Her sound wasn't as rich. Surrounding the wolf tone were somehow dampened, less focused. She wondered if it was similar to how people felt when they first took antidepressants and they lost their pain, but everything else needed to flatter, duller. In the end, she had to pay for the sound of all those centuries of tidal curves with her cello. Maybe Erica was her wolf tone. Maybe sometimes life would have lacked something subtle, but a, sin, a certain richness, a certain depth. Or maybe not. Maybe her life would have been great without Erica in it. And in me of all this decision to make, like, I don't, there've been a lot of times like in our marriage or whatever, where you're like, should we do this? Or should we, what's the best decision? And if we do this, is everything going to fall or not? And you find, you just have to make a choice and you have to just, and for me, she chose to keep Eric in her life. Maybe it would have been better without it, but enriched her life more than been without her and I, it was just a wonder to me that there are points in life where forward and trust that you're going to be able to deal with the consequences is it cindy or jana i cannot remember no jana oh sarah i was like um well good uh, my, I don't really have a favorite quote, but I like was, you know, laying in bed reading and like actually like, huh, like laughed out loud, startled my husband when we discovered Erica's little secret, which, you know, trying for no spoilers, but like that made me laugh so hard. And then like the continuation of that little storyline, I don't know why, but just thinking about I, it still, it just kind of makes me chuckle. And so I loved, I loved that little bit of storyline. And then anytime Vid was confused about basically like inappropriate social situations that like they joked, but he was seriously like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Like that, I loved Vid, um, which I mean, obviously he's kind of a fan favorite, but um, yeah, I just enjoyed all of that. And just, I really enjoyed uh, Erica's kind of neuroticism in general. Um, and then, yeah, her, her dirty little secret really um, made me laugh super hard. And I don't know why, but it just was like, perfect. So that was my favorite scene, if you will. Yeah, I really liked Vid. I liked that. Um, I have a note somewhere that says that he's a chameleon because like how he goes to the, 
and he meets the people at the symphony and he's like, those are my friends now and I'm going to invite them over for dinner. And he, you know, they go to the parent meeting and he can like kind of just work anywhere. He just like works the room. He doesn't care. He is who he is. And, and people accept him, you know, um, but I do have a quote and it's um, Dakota, like when she, um, like kind of like her first little scene where we really see her like struggling with whatever happened. Um, and she's in the room at night and she says, thinking about it made her feel as if she were all alone in a circle shaped room, circle shaped because her head was circle shaped with two little round windows, which were her eyes. And people tried to look in to understand her by looking through her eyes, but they couldn't see in. Not really. She was there in her circle shaped room all on her own. Like when she realizes she can lie and that she's like, oh, everyone else is doing it. But I just thought that was like so beautifully written and you know, that's not necessarily what people think of when they think of like chiclet or mysteries or stuff, but it's such a beautiful little scene set within the text. I liked it. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. I almost kicked myself out of the chat. Okay, so we're going to get into some of the really poignant quotes and then just kind of the statements or, or like the nuance that Demoy already unpacks as far as relationships go. So number three is uh, Erica's psychologist tells her, you've got to get this idea out of your head about there being some objective measure of normal normality. This normal person of whom you speak doesn't exist and says, do you agree? Do you think this relates to uh, Tolstoy's famous quote that each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way is the real normal that once you scratch the surface, no family is normal. Um, so that that's one way to take the question. But what I really loved about this quote is it actually reminded me of something that my therapist told me years ago. I was working through a lot of anxiety. And I remember saying, like, I wish I could just, you know, be a normal person that doesn't like struggle with anxiety. And she's like, there what? There is no normal. There is no such thing as normal. Um, that you have to get rid of that idea. <laughs> uh, so it's, it just kind of brought back that memory. And yeah, I, I don't know, we, you can take it in the family direction, or if you guys want to take it like on a personal direction, I always think about that. Like, is there I just have this idea that like, everyone else is like a plastic Barbie or like GIG soldier. And I, you know, and I'm like, just trying to make it but I know that isn't I know that isn't true at all. But I think that I can kind of get that idea stuck in my head. And yeah, I just loved the way we already unpacked that. Tabitha, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so I am anti-normal. I don't even understand what that word means. Um, and I don't think that we as a society even like that. We don't like that. We like things that are different and creative and people who are a little off. Like even if we like to laugh at them, we like it. We can enjoy everyone being different. So I think you should just and embrace being different and embrace being unique. Um, you know, even if it's a, if it's a family, um, no one likes anything to be the same. That's so boring. That's so gray. That's like, that's like a world without art or a world without nature. Like <laughs> we want, we want things to be different. And, um, I'm, I'm always telling my, my daughters about themselves as, as young ladies to be different. And, and I tell them all the time, there's nobody like you. God made you specifically like you. No one walks like you. No one talks like you. No one thinks like you. No one looks like you. And that is beautiful. And that's because God made you beautiful. And he likes different flowers and he likes different trees and he likes different bodies of water. He likes waterfalls. He likes lakes. Like I just go all in because I don't like that whole cookie cutter thing. Like it's not, what we're supposed to be. Um, so yes. So I'm, I just, I think that if people get that kind of stuck in their head, it's only going to make you fail. So once you get that out of your head, then you can soar. But that's my little soapbox moment, you know, because <laughs> I absolutely hate that, <laughs> hate that normal word. That was really good, Tav. Thanks for the soapbox. I think that I came of age, like now we have like the anxiety is like openly discussed and like depression and you know, the things that people you, that people struggle with are more like on the surface. But at least for me, when I was growing up and you guys, you guys can tell me if you agree, but like we kind of like didn't even like have language for like the way I was feeling, you know what I mean? Like I didn't even know like the way I felt was anxiety. And I think that, yeah, just t talking about this stuff and the way there's so much dialogue around it now and even like young adult books about stuff like this. And yeah, I think that that kind of 
like you said, it gets rid of that like normal idea and really celebrates that everyone is different. Everyone has different strengths and weaknesses and that's, that's the beauty of it. So I love that perspective, Tabitha. Sorry to cut in. And is it Jay, uh, not Jana, is it Cindy? Are you next or Eric? Yeah. Yeah, no worries. It's all good. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, I think that, um, normal is just, is subjective, just like beauty. You know, everybody has a different perspective of what beautiful is and everybody has their image of, you know, I want to look like this because this is beautiful, but my beautiful is different than your beautiful, then it's different from your beautiful. And I think normal is the same way. We have this idea that, you know, um, people live in the Cleaver, Beaver Cleaver household or, you know, people, um, particularly in high school, um, maybe they think that uh, every high school should be like the high school musical, you know, that, that, kind, that kind of thing. And I think it's really subjective. And I think we all lose sight of that, just like we lose sight about beauty. You know, not all of us are meant to have super bottom line, super model bodies with, you know, this or that or the other thing. It doesn't mean that we're less or we're just different, exactly what Tabitha, Tabitha was saying. So. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, my opinion that I, I agree, I, I don't know what normal is. I have no clue, um, but I know what my normal is. Yeah, I've kind of come to the conclusion that normal is like this, uh, that I don't know if it's like, or, or people that are the majority or what it is, but it's like a way of trying keep status quo because if you keep status quo then challenge um and then that concept of normal doesn't work especially now when you hear all of these um different voices that disagree on so many things there's no way that there can be one specific way of being normal um I just probably a way viewing the world is like this is what normal is and anything that falls outside of that needs to change to adapt to it yeah I mean I I also struggle with normal um it's funny you know and it's funny how like adult perspective changes things um, you know, I was, I was raised by two women in the nineties when it wasn't cool to have gay parents. And, um, you know, like that was, that was my, my battle, my burden. And it was, it gave it, you know, it was like a big deal and was something that, you know, I just always desperately wished I could be normal and I wasn't. And then it's funny, you know, like growing up and realizing, thinking back, like, the friends that I surrounded myself with as a child and I'm still friends with like they're, you know, they also didn't live a normal life. And we now, you know, like my husband kind of jokes with me about just in general and like everybody has a dysfunctional family, but um, you know, like we all mutually have like crazy dysfunctional families and we, you know, have dinner and we're like, Oh, ha ha. And you know, we know each other's siblings and all of that. And I think, I just, I guess I just wish, you know, and then like for Erica, that was so painful. And she had a friend that did have, you know, more of a quote unquote normal upbringing, but even I'm sure, you know, Clementine had things that she would were different as well. And I just, I don't know. I always feel so bad for kids because they're, you know, you feel so isolated thinking you're the only one that's not normal or I think just anybody that identifies as not normal you think you're the only one that's not normal and I don't know I mean I think that's one of the as much as like the internet can be an awful black hole I do think that's also like one advantage that you know this generation has over our generation is they can you know reach out with a click of a button and find their tribe with people that are that same kind of normal that's not normal but it's it's normal because that's your people and that's your your group what you identify with so um that was kind of a rambly tangent but yeah i have a problem with normal as well i had to come to terms that you know nobody nobody's normal nobody had a normal childhood nobody has a normal adult life um and just kind of 
handle it. But I mean, like, that's, I, my heart hurt for Erica a little bit. Like, I get that. Like, um, but I just, yeah, normal's, nobody's normal. There's no such thing. Normal's what you make it. Yeah, I remember I had a, a good friend. We're still friends. But I remember thinking, like, that her family was, like, the perfect normal, you know, like, parents not married or parents are still married, not divorced, you know, like, beautiful girls. But then, like, especially now I'm an adult looking back, and there was nothing wrong with her family, you know, per se. But, like, looking back, I was like, oh, like, just weird things where you're like, oh, that was weird or that was weird or – and then, like, eventually, like, when we became adults, like, then, like, the dark secrets came out of the closet of what was, like, really going on. And it was kind of like, oh, so even they looked like they had it all together. And, like, they really didn't have it all together, you know? And, I mean, and, of course, there are families out there who maybe don't have it all together, but they have it more together than others. Um, but... And, like, my parents didn't, like, they, they had it together mostly, most of the time. But, you know, I still had, like, divorced parents and, you know, a stepbrother. And so, you know, like, sometimes you feel like that's weird. And my dad was, you know, had had a stroke at 22, so he was disabled. So it was just kind of like, you know, both of my parents lived with their parents for most of my life. So you're just kind of like, oh, that's not like what everybody else is. Um, but I, I think that kind of made it really interesting. So I was really close with both my grandmas and I don't think every kid can say that because my grandmother's like never spoiled me because they were like mom number two. And so I think it just made for like a different life. And my mom's like, everybody come and live at my house and we're like the halfway house for all of the, the wayward children. And so like all my brother's friends lived there and I had friends who lived with us and that stuff's not normal. So I had like, just a very like different and I think that's great because I think that's part of why I relate to my students even though they at first they see me and they're like oh you know you are a privileged white lady who has a job and is a teacher and I'm like well you know and I tell them stories and they're like things are crazy <laughs> you know but it helps them realize like that doesn't automatically mean you live this way or that way you you know different people are doing different things and everyone has that family member who's doing something unsavory at some point in time that affects everyone and you know that everyone has to go through stuff and sad sad life at some point totally i'm glad that we unpacked that one we haven't talked about normal before and all our living well discussions all right number four so erica's mom is a hoarder and that's like a big underlying theme in their theme is probably not the right word, but it's an underlying thing in the in the book, especially for Erica. So and that's not really a, a spoiler. But the question is, Sylvia's hoarding is a major source of embarrassment and sorrow for Erica. She reflects, her mother loved things so much that she had nothing. What do you make of that line? I, that was one of those lines I just read over and over and over again. And I just kind of wanted to unpack it with you guys. You know, of course, she has all these things in her in her home. And you know, it, I get the impression that she has a, a larger home and she inherited some money. So she has plenty of, of resources to kind of indulge this behavior. Um, so she just has so much that she has nothing. And I thought that, you know, even those of us who, who aren't hoarders can, I think like there's, there's definitely a line that we can cross where it's like, we have so much, we have nothing. And I, I don't know, I, I live in LA. So there's a, there's a lot of excess. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just thought a lot, of, a lot about that. I'd love to know kind of what you guys made of that. What did you think, Tab? Well, what I was thinking about is um, just how she, you know, of all the things that she's collected over the years, that the one thing she wasn't able to obtain was her daughter's respect, you know, or admiration. Like her daughter just clung to Pam and um, I don't know, that's so sad because you just think about kind of like what you would hope for your kids is that they'll, um, I don't know, that they'll respect you, that they'll, I know that there's something, that there's a connection there and it just seems like because of the stuff, the stuff got in the way from there being a connection um, 
that could be like life, you know, a lifelong. So they only had like that one moment where she shows the photograph um, when they were on the, the, the roller coaster. But just think about like, well, how many moments did you miss out um, because of the shame and the things like, I don't know, that's just something we can think about. Like I, um, like I feel like my mother is like close to a hoarder type personality and I understand why, but growing up that way, it's like I didn't grow up with, it wasn't disgusting or anything like that, but it was just a bunch of stuff and it makes you feel so closed in and suffocating. So I'm like the opposite. I try to like, I'm like, I constantly declutter. I constantly declutter because I don't want that same kind of feeling, that claustrophobic feeling like you, you can't get into the closet like what's the purpose of a closet if you can't get into it um but yeah so i think that that's something to focus on like it's not about stuff it's about relationships and that should really be about taking the time more time to accumulate good moments with the people that we care about versus things yeah i thought this was uh an interesting line as well i think um i, I I think she was a nurse, right? If I'm not mistaken, she was a nurse and was taking care of people. And um, and uh, uh, I think it was implied that uh, she was a nurturer to some degree. Um, you know, being a nurse, and she she took pride in in helping other people. And you know, um, it's interesting because um, for some reason I always have the vision of I don't know if you um, have heard that story about um, you know the you put a few big stones in a jar, is it full? And then you put, you know, sand in the jar or, you know, pebbles in the jar, is it full? I, I kind of vision this, like she's got all this stuff in the jar, but she doesn't have the, the big stones to start with. She doesn't have the things that are important, the family, the, the work, the, the stuff that we typically get fulfillment from. And she's trying to fill her jar with all these stones that really maybe don't have value or, yeah, I guess value is the best way to, to put it. So she has all these things, but she doesn't have, but she has nothing. She doesn't have the thought, the, you know, what the value that uh, her family brings. Um, I guess her husband left her, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, her daughter, she didn't have a relationship with her daughter. Um, you know, she's surrounded by stuff. She's paranoid. Like, you can't even open the door to a solicitor because, you know, they can't see what's on the other side of the door. So um, I found it very interesting. Like I said, I, I just have this vision of the jar being full of like little pebbles, but none of the really the meat and potatoes of, of what gives typically a fulfilling life. Uh, yeah, this was a line that I read over and over again too, like um, just thinking about it. Um, I read but there was a book that said something about um it's a really a novel concept but um we consume so much that we can't enjoy what we're consuming as consumers like uh think of that in the sense that like like she's obviously I mean, it kind of hinted at the fact that this was like um like other issues and this was a way of coping with like feeling secure or whatever um like in acquiring all this other stuff she neglected like paying the bills and taking care of her kid and making sure that she was um like um and to make parallels to the people that strive so much um, to make more money, to get more things, um, to, you know, give their kids a better life or whatever. And then they, they end up not knowing their kids at all. And maybe their kids are provided for, but they don't, their parents, they don't have a relationship with them or whatever. Um, think it was an exaggerated way of showing how like after things that are not at all fulfilling to the detriment of things that could probably um, solve the problem if we time relationship um, 
and to the hard things, um, then we wouldn't need all of the uh, distraction of buying more and more in order to fulfill some need that's not being met. I, yeah, I mean, I read this and was just like, yep. I mean, exact. I mean, I feel like that, that quote sums up <laughs> hoarding. I joke a, a, a lot about being a hoarder just because I'm a messy person. And, um, I don't know. I mean, I, well, anyway, joking, all jokes aside, I honestly believe my sister is a hoarder and I mean, not like, like paths, not like the show. But yeah, I mean, I felt like that summed her up exactly because she will, I mean, like there is nothing that isn't of value to her because she might need it someday or whatever. She just is so connected to things and does not take care of the relationships in her life. She will burn a bridge with um, a person that should matter, you know, um, like family relationships, but then she has just all of this crap. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time at her house, but the last time I was there, she had an entire dresser just covered, I mean, like stacked high with um, like ornate um, empty, like cigarette box, uh, not cigarette boxes, um, cigar boxes. You know, like they're pretty and they have gold foil on them, whatever, but it was like, well, not, there's like a hundred of them. What are you going to do with these? You know, and like, they're like falling. And I was just like, oh, what is happening? She had like five chairs in one corner that half of them were missing a leg. And I was just like, oh, this is insane. And that's, I mean, like, that's it. Like she has so much stuff and has nothing because it's just about the object and half of it's broken or you break things that do matter. Um, I mean, I just, I don't know. Yeah. Like it just instantly was like, oh, that's, that's like the perfect, I, that perfectly sums up, um, you know, like my experience of somebody that I do think is a hoarder, um, not, not any special hoarders, but, um, definitely has a problem with things. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, yeah, I thought it was perfect. Yeah, I think it's just like a great comment on like consumerism in general. Um, my older son is definitely like every day he wants something, whether it's like I want to go eat somewhere or I want this new app. Even if it's a free app, it's just like this like insatiable need to like feel this like I need to get something. And I'm like, you're not getting something today. I don't know what you're thinking. And we tell him no all the time. So it's not like we say like yes to everything he asks for because we – most certainly do not because that's insane. Um, but it doesn't stop him from feeling like that. And so I think it's just like, I don't know if it's because people don't have to wait. Like we like as a whole society, no matter where your income level is, people in general have more than people of that similar income level would have had 30 years ago. There's just like this need to have more and to have more status. and um, just like how Clementine and Sam are just like, oh, look at this beautiful house. And they would be really cool, wealthy. They're wealthier friends. So they're not just more like Vid and Tiffany aren't just cooler friends. They're like also wealthier is like part of their comment. And there's just like, so it's not just with Erica's mom that this is kind of like a thing. It's, you know, it's there in other characters too. And this is just kind of like the status thing. And I mean, we're all guilty to some degree of it. And I joke like Sarah, like I'll be like, oh, I'm just like, Hoarding stuff, but um, like messier, and especially like compared to like my husband's mom, who's like, oh, these letters from my friends in Cuba that I haven't seen in sixty years. So I'll just throw them away because, like, who cares? Um, because she's like, that's fine. Like, I'm never gonna see them again. I haven't seen them in sixty years since I left Cuba. That's fine. And you know, like, that's like she's just like cool with it. And I don't, you know, and I'm like, what? Those are precious letters, you you know, and memories. And she's, you know, um. But I realize, like, you can just throw stuff like that away. And the older I get, the more I realize that. And, you know, I think it, we can be overly sentimental. And, of course, like, I might hoard my books, though. Like, 
just, just on the down low. We might have a book problem, but uh, I don't know. I think that we like, of course, like as a, like a religious person, I think that it's our way of filling other things that were, maybe we should be building a relationship with God's people and God and stuff. Like, of course, as a religious person, like that's like where my mind automatically goes, but I know not everyone goes there or believes that. But even if you're not religious in that sense, like in a spiritual way, like, like you should be building relationships with people. And I know that it said that like Erica says the only thing her mom friends, like that's the only thing she didn't hoard. And I think it, it is, it's because, people are just more difficult or even it goes back to like when we read Sean and Nequest about like, you can have like your fast, like airport friend and make quick relationships, but having those deep complicated relationships just takes so much more emotional energy that just like having the stuff or the fast food friend is so much easier. Yes. Completely agree. Erica, you articulated what I was trying to articulate. So thanks for that. <laughs> we just, Jane and we just were having a discussion in the chat about books and whether like we have too many or if we're a hoarder or not, or I guess I am. So I've been on book, book buying restriction for two months and counting now. We'll see how long it goes because i got to get to reading some of these. Anyway. All right, Sarah, remind me, Katrina. So I asked Katrina how you say Debussy because I always forget. And Sarah reminded me before the chat and I can't remember. Sarah, will you please educate us again? How do you pronounce it? I think it was Debussy. Debu Debussy. Okay. Yeah. The epigraph is Claude Debussy. A Claude Debussy quote, music is the silence between the notes. How significant are silences and the unsaid in this novel? So I was hoping that Katrina could join us tonight. She had a photography engagement, which is like her second second job, uh, because she's a, she's a musician and her husband is also a musician. So they're kind of our, our pro musicians in the in the group. But, but um, yeah, I, I think this is this is interesting and something that comes a lot comes up comes up a lot, the silence between the notes. What I've been thinking about this was just with life and learning you know, I talk a lot about this in vlogs and stuff but you know in this season I'm learning to care for myself like for the first time and, and learning to rest and learning that really like the beauty of life is found in those pauses and and same with same with music so yeah I I'm not exactly sure how that relates to the novel that probably went a little bit over my head but I would love I love your guys' thoughts so Tab will pass the ball to you Okay, so I was thinking about Clementine and, you know, her being a cellist and like this idea that I have about musicians that, oh, you know, they're so emotional and they're so like connected to their art. And then it's just like um, they like to express themselves. But then like in the, in the novels, like the, she is not expressing herself to all these people who are around her. Like everything that's going on with her husband or everything that she feels about Erica, how she feels about her mom. Like she's feeling, she's feeling, she's feeling, but she's not expressing any of this. And it just kind of makes me go, okay, um, yeah, you should, you should like use this opportunity to, to talk. Uh, you gotta, you have to talk because these relationships will, you know, will shut down. You almost lost either relationship with your husband. You almost lost relationship with a friend or someone who you've known for 12 years. Was it? No, since you were 12. Um, so yeah. So what, what's going on with that? Like as a musician or as someone in tune with your feelings, I want you to be able to express them in another way so that you can have the value in your life for the other people who are around you. Cause just think about, I mean, how many people can say they have a person who has, been in their life for that long and still wants to be in your life <laughs> for that long like a person likes you that much so want to still be your friend uh i don't know there's value in that so that's that's what made me think of and the fact that she was a cellist so i don't know if that matches what we're talking about but that's the only thing that came to my head uh when i read this um the first thing i thought about was um when I read music is the silence between the notes, I immediately thought of the elderly neighbor. And um, I felt like, I felt like his storyline had music and his in particular, there was a lot of space between his notes or what he said or what he did. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of unsaid, a lot of information that the neighbors didn't have about him. And again, without giving too much away, 
um, he had his own stuff um, going on. And um, the fact that uh, in the situation, he uh, he really stepped up and all, paid ultimately the a really high price for it. Um, that that was a lot of uh, silence between the notes. So um, that was probably the most poignant and the most um, interesting relating to um, to that quote, in, in my opinion. Um, I am not at all a musician. I haven't played anything since probably seventh grade. Um, but I have listened to... Um, like a lot of, not a lot of, but some um, like speeches and s TED talks and stuff like that about music and like my one of my friends was like a music major in college and so I would help her study for tests so I would get some music theory stuff um, kind of secondhand. Um, really wrong about this, um, but my understanding is that between the notes in music there's always some sort of attention because when it's silent, you don't know where it's going next. Is the note going to remain the same? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Is it going to totally change keys? What's going to happen when they start playing again? Um, so like in this story, um, like after the barbecue, there's just silence between all these different people and the, all of these relationships. Um, and even before then, there's a lot of silence, like things that are left unsaid that probably need to be said. Um, and so there's that tension there of like what's going to happen, especially between um, Clementine and Sam. Like um, they were both afraid to talk about what happened because they were afraid to take the blame and they were afraid to blame each other. Um, and so and so they just they didn't talk about it and so there was that tension there um that was like pulling them apart um they were kind of forced to have that conversation they knew where it was going and they could kind of follow where that conversation led them um and so that was kind of what i got out of it was that um the silence leads to tension because you don't fully know what's going to happen. And the only way that you can break that tension is to break the silence. I think, yeah, I, I think because the, all the emotion and anticipation is between the notes. Just, I mean, basically, yeah, just what Erica said. Um, and there's so much drama in the silence. And I think it's because of the anticipation and like the letdown, you know, of the emotion, anything that was stirred while the music is playing. And then you have that like the moment to breathe and reflect on what you heard. Um, and then as far as, yeah, in the book, there was so much um, tension and anticipation in the silence and the not knowing um, and, you know, Sam silently suffering and everybody's guilt and I just, um, cause I think that's where the tension is, you know, it's either the building or the letting go, you know, but I'm, ah, no, nothing about music. I'm not Katrina. <laughs> I know she picked a fine time to leave us. Gosh. <laughs> um, let's see. Sorry, Jana, go ahead. It's okay. I know. I was like, where is Katrina on the night we, we needed her for this? Um, I, I'm not a musician, but like from dance, the same kind of perspective. Um, a lot of times when you're choreographing, you want to like move, 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 move. And you got to like slow it down and really emote those slow um, spaces. But I think a lot of dancers have kind of the same Clementine like thing going on. Like they use that as a way to kind of like get out their emotions and then sometimes you know, I've, I've heard dancers say like, yeah, I'm just having a hard day. I don't want to talk about it. I'm just going to dance it out. But then you don't necessarily face up to the, the problem, right? It just stays in that restful silence or, you know, they really like 
rock it and they're hardcore that night and then it doesn't make the problem go away. It just keeps allowing you to feed your creativity, but it doesn't necessarily like ease the pain that you're feeling. And I think in, in the book, the silence is because, you know, I'm a verbose person. So I'm like, just talk to each other. Like Sam and Clementine. I'm just like, how do you go to dinner and like fake it? And like, not just be like, I'm mad at you. Cause I'm going to be the person who's going to be like, this is not happening. We're going to talk this out. I don't care if you want to be weird. Like we're going to, we're not sleeping until this is done because like, I'm just not doing that. That's crazy. Um, and so I think that the silences really represent, uh, like Erica said, that tension that like keeps building and building and something has to snap. Like, like when Dakota finally breaks, right? Like everything just finally breaks, like for, for each of the characters when it happens and sometimes in a flood of tears and sometimes not. But I think it, it is that it's that important that that push and the pull and like just holding it out as long as they can kind of thing. I don't know. I, I like that though. Um, just that, I don't know the, because it's not necessarily silences in the text. She doesn't have like some authors will do like the big gaps to, to represent that, but they're just, it's in the, they're, they are thinking things, but they're not saying it. And intensifies i think the the mystery of the text thank you thank you dana all right this next question is totally in my wheelhouse it's kind of what you know my heart is for just life and so it, the question is what does clementine mean when she thinks back on the extraordinary ordinariness of her life before the barbecue. How is the ordinary treated in this novel? Do you think it's inevitable that we don't appreciate the ordinary? Do we need a life event as jarring as what happened to Sam and Clementine in order to fully appreciate our lives? So, you know, my paper and glam, my whole, my whole brand, my whole heart is celebrating, you know, the sacred and the ordinary. So yeah, I feel like I've talked to you guys' ear off on this over over the years. So I'm just going to pass it to Tab because I want to hear what you guys have to say. Um, I think that um, some of the things that we can all relate to are those simple things, you know, where we can start, you know, talking about, you know, a favorite, you know, coffee mug and like how simple that is. But we can all relate to it and we can connect in some way. Um, so I know I, I like the simple. I think that. Um, if we take the time, then we can, I know we can just find really interesting things in, in some of the simple things. Um, even if it's just, you know, like a smell or a feeling or, you know, a memory or a song, like those things are pretty simple things. Um, and I, I do, I like them. I think that it's, it's it, what connects us. I think what connects us are the really simple things that we don't even think about. Like if we visit a friend, like it's not about where we go. It's just about, hey, the moments that we've had and, you know, that I like talking to you, like just having a conversation. How simple is that? Um, doesn't cost anything. Like <laughs> we can really appreciate that, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think that the simple things are like, the grand things. So I don't know if it should be called simple. I, don't know. I think it's human nature to be complacent about life and just kind of tick away and take for granted when your life is is boring and uneventful and unextraordinary. Um, and I absolutely do believe that um, a life event, um, a life changing event, will will jar anybody into appreciating um, the way things were. I think we've all had life events where, um, you know, this before, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, pos a negative thing. It could be a positive thing too. Like we all talk about our lives before we had children and we talk about our lives before we were married and we talk about our lives before this and our lives before that. So if you think of, you know, um, anybody who's lost somebody, um, you know, you, you have your life before that, life changing event happened you know if you had a, a, a diagnosis of an illness you know you have um you know i took for granted when i was healthy and now maybe i'm not healthy or someone i love or you know um so i think i think it's interesting and uh i think it's uh a lot of us maybe don't take the time to pause and reflect to appreciate the extraordinary in the ordinary 
I'm, I don't know if it's my personality or just like my life experiences. Um, but I kind of like live for the ordinary. Like if my life is not ordinary, I am stressed out. I mean, it doesn't mean that like, like I like to go on vacations. I like to go on adventures and do new things, but my stress levels go up like exponentially and I cannot survive in that. So I like live for like my ordinary days, my routine. Um, it doesn't mean I'm doing the same thing all the time. Like I'm not a person that's like for breakfast, I eat this and for lunch, I eat this. And every day I do this from this time to this time. Like I couldn't do that, but like my every day, take the kids to school, come home, do stuff around the house. Um, bring the kids home, work on homework, hang out with the kids, all that stuff. Like, like that's enjoyable to me. Like I don't definitely do appreciate it even more or like after, you know, like or goes through an illness or like a family friend dies or whatever happens. Like I definitely appreciate it more in my life where like I I don't need something major to happen. I'm, I guess, content enough in my life as it is that I enjoy the fact that it is ordinary. And, um, like, that's kind of, I, I don't want it to become extraordinary, even though, like, that, like, oh, I don't want anything big and wondrous to happen to me. Um, I just, I don't need that in order to um, feel, I guess, or to um, be grateful for what I have every day around me. See, and I guess I took that as, you know, we don't realize how ordinary our lives are until something actually crazy happens. You know, like, I, I took it from the perspective of I'm constantly running around just thinking like, oh, life is so crazy. This is out of control. And I'm running here and there and everywhere. And like a chicken with my head cut off. And then something like truly stressful or truly tragic happens. And you kind of realize, oh, life is so calm regularly compared to this giant life event that just happened. Um, and I do, I mean, I think, and maybe not even something traumatic, but I do think it takes perspective shifts, whatever brings on that perspective shift, um, for us to kind of be able to see and take accurate inventory of our life, lives and what's, you know, kind of like going on and what's the actuality of things, not just the, the emotion and the hustle and the bustle and the, um, the excitement to be kind of strong and anxious. So I'm always like, ah! Um, so I think it, it takes a perspective shift or a slowing down or something to make you realize like, okay, nope, this is just ordinary and this is routine. And, um, but I guess that's just, that was how I took it. I like that, Sarah. Cause I, you know, even like stuff that we say is like, oh, this is so crazy. Like I have a friend who like the craziest thing happened to me today. And then I'm like, it's like totally like a regular people thing. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and I'll say it cause I'm like a bad friend that way. Um, <laughs> but you know, I do think sometimes we're like, Oh my gosh, the craziest thing happened. And it's like, dude, that happens to people every day all around the world. Uh, so it's not really that crazy. And, and, but I'm like very like stoic and flat that way. Um, because I think even if you're looking at, the other way of like, oh, my life's so boring and ordinary. What if I had a glamorous life? Like wealthy people, like they don't have a glamorous life either. Like they wake up, they do their workout. If they have, if they're like some type of musician or actor or actress or something like that, they got to do their workout. Cause they got to like keep like, you know, fit. They have like a specific diet. Like they just have a different everyday ordinary, but it's pretty like, they got to do their thing like, um, you know, and they're, a lot of them are answering to someone and that thing has to be done. And I'm not really answering to anyone, but me. So that's better. 
and you know um that's not like i think that some people think that like oh if i have money or if i'm famous like i'm gonna live this extraordinary life and i travel all these beautiful places but people that are touring and traveling like they don't even get to see those beautiful places they're like stuck in hotel rooms and tour buses and on stage and practicing and sleeping and back on their tour bus and that's not really that that like to me that does not sound fun that sounds like i want to go back home and read my book and like be with people and so i think like that we can easily think that somebody else's like exotic life is so amazing but we don't live it and we don't know how stressful that is too and we just like should love our own exciting boring life where maybe the most exciting thing that happens is your car battery dies that's awesome if that's the worst thing and most exciting thing that happens that day you're doing pretty good in life i think yeah it's so true i love what you said jana and erica you too i'm definitely i relate to you very much erica i'm definitely someone that just like to be at home with like my dog and my books and my mom's always like, you need to get out, you need to see LA, you need to take advantage of the city, which she's totally right. And I just want to be at home with Sunday and my books. <laughs> um, and yeah, Jana, I love what you said too. I think that like everyone has boxes to check every day. Like it doesn't matter what your career is or how successful you are or not. Like everybody has like, they got to still, you know, go through the day and check it off. Oh, and I get really fascinated with like the travel bloggers. I don't know if you guys ever feel this way, but there's, I follow some travel bloggers on Instagram and they have like three kids and they're in like Hong Kong and Turks and Caicos and like, I don't even know, like New York, like all in the same month. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can barely like get out of the city for a weekend without being like totally, <laughs> totally snowed under. So yeah, it's just like fascinating to me how people can do that. But I know like they, like they have boxes to check too, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing because I'm just such a like a, a routine routine type of person. All right, last but not least, at near the end of the novel, Clementine wonders what sort of person Erica could have been, would have been, should have been, if she'd been given the privilege of an ordinary home. You could jump so much higher when you had somewhere safe to fall. Do you agree or is it the opposite? And this is kind of such a paradox in life because I think a lot of times it can be the opposite, like struggle breeds strength and you know, of course, it's probably a balance thereof. But, you know, I'm sure we all know people who overcoming struggle gave them like such incredible leverage in their life. And then we know, you know, folks who who had a very, very safe uh, upbringing that kind of, they knew they were kind of going to be taken care of and maybe, um, you know, maybe didn't jump as far as, as they, they could have if, if it was kind of like ride or die time. So anyway, it's just something I think, I think about a lot. And especially I think about it like with, at, no, I'm not a parent, but I think about it in terms of like raising kids. Like I, I bet my, my parents in the group must think a lot about this in, in raising kids. And I just think about how my mom, you know, raised me and yeah. All right. I'll stop my ramble. Tabitha, you're, you're, you're a mama. What do you think about this? Okay. I'll pick up on your ramble. Um, I, I really like the, you know, the concept that struggle brings strength. Um, but then now I'm experiencing the flip side. I'm, I know a mother and I have more to offer for my girls than I had growing up. And so now I'm, you know, I'm grateful for those things and those were goals of mine. But now I'm always concerned about other aspects of them and their personality like, oh, are you not going to have any fight? Are you not going to have any grit? Like, you you know, it can't be too easy. I don't want it to be too easy, but it, it's just like, it's like a constant battle. You're like, well, if it was the other way, you're like, oh, it'd be nice to have all of these things. And then now you're like, but I still need you to have this. I still want you to appreciate. And I don't know, it's such a, you know, there's so much going on with that. You're trying to find the balance. I know I'm trying to find the balance with them because at the same time, I want them to have experiences, great experiences that I didn't have. I still want them to have the parts of me that I felt like I got from my circumstances. So hmm. it's definitely, um, it's about balance, still trying to figure it out, trying to find the, the right balance and reference to them um, with that. But um, but I think that I'm happy that it's on my mind <laughs> to to think about it because I you know to know both sides. So um, yeah, just trying to just trying to have balance. I totally agree with you. 
Um, this reminded me of the quote, which I quickly Googled from, do you guys remember last October when we were reading um, A Discovery of Witches? Um, I think Matthew says when they're talking, when they're pregnant, I think that, oh, spoiler, oops. Um, uh, that's not the book we read. That's not my bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's the book after that. I'm just kidding. Go anyway, ahead. Later on, there's a really great, great quote, um, that somebody says about <laughs> all children need is love, a grown up to take responsibility for them and a soft place to land. And I really love that. Um, sorry. And I totally agree. I mean, I think that is what is important is like kids need that launch pad. Um, but I also, I mean, like you Tabitha, I struggle with that because sometimes it's like, I mean, cause I firmly, despite, you know, like having struggled in my childhood, like I definitely had that soft place to land. Um, and, but it's different balancing that, you know, with my own child, like, um, cause some of the things, uh, that my mom like I just because I'm so like I'm just overly cautious despite the fact that like my mom would take my cousins and I on the river and be like okay bye hike up river so when you drowned I can fish your body out of the river like you know just she just was real practical about those things and she was like I mean I don't want you to be a lost body forever and I have heart attacks and like I have heart attacks having landed in her house and like he has to wear a life jacket at all times when he's with you which I never had to wear a life jacket as a kid. So I have a hard time, like, I have a hard time with that balance um, of being maybe a little bit too much of an overprotective mama bear, but then wanting, but then having to like rationalize. So like, he's 11 now, so we decide, like, over the summer, we, his friend lives like, I don't know, four or five blocks away from us. And so I was like, okay, do we, have, we have to let him walk to his friend's house because I was, you know, do it my mom has no clue what I was doing, you know, like, um, with my cousins during the summer and, you know, I have to find a friend so I can track him all the way to his friend's house. But like, I realized you got, you got to be able to like, let them do these things, but it is so hard. Um, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, like it's, it's complicated. Um, it's difficult trying to find that balance, I think. Um, but I definitely do think, um, that kids, need to um have that soft place to land and some sort of security i think um you know insecurity can definitely breed grit but i think security makes for kids that can be more adventurous and try their wings and branch out a little bit more sarah it's like so hilarious because my neighbor like i mean like we don't really let our kids go like anywhere either and our neighbor her son's like a sophomore in high school and she's like I found out he went around the block to food for less because and I was like he's a sophomore in high school like he can get a driver's license at the end of this year like like you have to understand like he, she's like no like but you know where we live <laughs> like, it's just so funny because like like her boys and my boys are the same age and so we let them play like out front and we like open the windows and like I can hear them and people are like oh, you let them play outside without you sitting out there and I'm like dude I gotta cook dinner like and it, and I need them to like go outside and have friends and so it, it's so hard that like they have to stay like where I can see them out the window and at all times and usually the sophomore boy is out there so it's like there is like a 15 year old child out there it's not like they're alone but like it's very shocking to other people because it's they're like but that kid's only 15 and I'm like and the babysitter's 16 <laughs> like you know it's not that big of a difference um I'm definitely like my, I had very permissive parents. Um, not with me so much as my brothers, but since I have boys, I'm like, I'm definitely more, um, like strict with them than my parents were. Like I was kind of allowed to watch whatever and kind of like, you know, like I watched Melrose place, like when I was like in third grade, like that's, a, you know, and I, whereas like I have boys, so I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't watch the first Transformers because Megan Fox is like totally like, you know, a piece of meat in that movie. And they're like staring at her butt while she's like, I'm like, no, they're going to like objectify women if they watch that. Like, I'm so like, and not so much like with violence and, and stuff, but I like, I'm very sensitive to like objectification of women and nudity with my children. 
I, not that like I was exposed. I mean, I watched like Melrose Place, but like, you know, I, but at the same time, I, that was like, there was like the first homosexual character on Melrose Place. And like, you know, like I kind of learned about like AIDS and stuff. And it was actually very educational um, in those ways. And so I don't know, like, I, sometimes I wonder like, am I doing them a disservice by being so paranoid and strict and trying to keep them like innocent? Or, you know, am I like, it's such a hard, like, balance and you know like I was a rule follower so I think that's part of it too is like is your kid a rule follower so you know you can trust them doing these things or are they gonna like take the rules and be like oh they're you're only giving me these five rules cool so I'll break all five of them and then we can just do whatever we want um because I had a lot of friends who were like that like crazy and so I didn't have a curfew I didn't have anything I had very liberal and permissive parents and they knew it was okay because they knew I didn't drink. They knew I didn't smoke and that I wouldn't because I was like the type to break their cigarettes. And, um, you know, that's, I don't know. So I think it's, it's just really hard because those things do make it like, I think they do develop though, like who you are and how you perceive the world. I think if I had had a lot of rules, but been like a rule follower, I would have been like, why do I have so many rules? I'm a good girl. Like, why do you keep punishing me? Punishing me? So I think it, and just the way your families are does make a difference in who you are. And like, my kids are way more spoiled than we ever were. And I can tell that now. And I'm like, oh, you guys are going to be those like snowflake bratty kids. And like, we're not having that around here. And so, like, we've been doing a lot of taking away. Like, you're being disrespectful. You can't have that. You don't deserve things. Um, but it's really hard, I think, to, you know, if you have the ability to give them stuff you want. To give them stuff. Interesting. I like that you and Sarah, Jana, you and Sarah touched on kind of physical safety. Because that's something I think about a lot. Because, you know, I was raised a small town girl. So, you know, we rode in the back of trucks and, you know, no seatbelt, no helmet on bikes, you know, no life jacket, and, you know, going down the river, walk down to the store, like the doors were never locked at night, like none of that. Like I never, you know, and I, obviously I'm perfectly safe. Uh, but yeah, I think about that and I always felt safe in the world. And I wonder if my parents have been like, no, you have to do this and wear a life jacket and, you know, like, wear your seatbelt and, you know, you can't go to the store and you, you know, you're not safe. Like, I wonder like what that would have, like how that would have shaped, shaped my world instead of just like feeling, feeling safe in the world. But I think it was Tabitha said, but yes, since that time, creepers have ruined the world. So <laughs> there you go. All right. That is a wrap. I know we're over time. So thank you guys for your time and letting us go a little over. We actually, I love, one of the things I love about Moyarty is sometimes like it's hard to think of discussion questions for fiction because it's kind of like, this is what happened, but she always has a ton to discuss. So that's, she's great. So next month we're reading our last quarterly classic of the year, which is Anne of Green Gables. So we are reading a children's book uh, every year at, as part of our quarterly classics. So this is such a just beautiful fall book. And I am so excited to talk about Anne of Green Gables uh, the last Thursday in October, whatever the date is there. So thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to give this video a thumbs up so every, other readers can find us. There is a Paper and Glam Instagram, book club Instagram now, and that is in the comments. And also the book club stickers from this year are 50% off in the outlet if you would like some extras or like want to write some reviews in your planner or whatever. Because in November, which is coming up right around the corner, we'll be re releasing the 2018 list, which is all done and we're just making stickers now. So that's that. Thank you guys for joining and have a fabulous night. Thanks for reading along with us. <laughs>